What that means is the harvest is ripe and plenty for all of us to go out there and be witnesses for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our topic this morning is Genesis and the Sovereignty of God. This is not just a talk about Genesis. This is a talk about who our God is and what his message to us is. And I'm going to give you a list of topics. It's going to break from the norm. We're going to have more than three points. <laughs> We're going to start with a little background. We need to understand what we mean by sovereignty. Point one will be establishing a foundation. Point two, Genesis is key to understanding the gospel. Point three, Genesis will be key to understanding end times. Then we're going to talk about the great battle, the long war against God. And then it's lunchtime. <laughs> so let's talk about the sovereignty of God. What that means is God is the absolute ruler and authority over all things. Nothing stands in his way. He is the absolute ruler. We see these things in Colossians 1.16 says he created all things. The very first book of the Bible, first chapter, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. What that means he's the creator of all things. It means he owns us. He sets the rules and standards for how we are to live. That's how important that verse is. He is called the Most High in Genesis 14, 19. Revelation 1, verse 8, he is called the Almighty. And in Luke 1, 33, his kingdom will never end. He is the absolute sovereign ruler over all things. He will share that with nobody. Let's take a look at 1 Chronicles 29, verse 11, the sovereignty of God. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty. For all that is heaven and earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. He is the sovereign ruler. In Matthew 28, verse 18, we read, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He is the absolute sovereign ruler. And now let's take a turn and take a look at the theme of the word he has given us. A theme of the Bible. Paradise created, paradise lost, paradise restored, and it all points to Jesus Christ. That will be our theme. And we take a look at the first two of those, paradise created and paradise lost. Guess what book of the Bible we find those first two? The book of Genesis. And Paradise Restored will be in the last book. We will cover the entire Bible today in 50 minutes. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> so let's go to part one. Establishing the foundation. Genesis will be our foundation. Understanding Genesis and time. When I read the Bible, it says God created in six days. But nope, some people say, you're wrong, Mike. It took millions of years. We're going to settle that matter today. And there will be no compromise. Marines do not compromise. And neither should Christians. So it doesn't matter what we believe. Well, let's talk about how should we interpret Genesis. How should we interpret what the days mean? Should we look at the context of the words? Should we look for scripture support? And how about language structure? Or should we go to science and commentaries and consensus? I'm going to let you take a vote on that one. If you vote on the wrong one, folks, you've been warned about push-ups already. <laughs> how many vote for context, scripture support, and language structure? If you don't vote, there's also a penalty. <laughs> Yes. Context, scripture, support, and language. Not science. We don't need science to interpret scripture. Commentaries, folks, they're not the word of God and they can be an error. And consensus, we do not go to consensus theology. So, defining our terms. Do you know the first use of the word day is actually defined in the Bible, Genesis 1, verse 5, where we read this. God called the light day. There's a definition right there. The light portion is a day. He defined it for us. Then he also gives us another definition. And the darkness he called night, so evening and morning were the first day. Folks, there's your definition. How can anybody miss that? Nowhere in there you see millions of years. He defines the word day. And then he gives us more evidence. First day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day. Everywhere 
In the Old Testament, we see the word day with an ordinal number. It always means a literal day. There are no exceptions to this. Then he further defines it. Evening and morning, first day. Evening and morning, second day. Evening and morning, third day. Everywhere in the Old Testament, we see evening and morning. The context is always a literal day. There should be no doubt that God's creation was in six literal days. Now I have a question for you. Anybody here believe the Ten Commandments? I don't know why. They're kind of old, aren't they? I mean, these things are thousands of years old. We've learned a lot of new things since then, haven't we? You still believe them? Okay, who wrote them? Was it God or Charlton Heston? <laughs> Young people don't know that one yet, but God wrote them down. Now, let me ask you another question. If we were to turn to the book of Exodus and read the Ten Commandments, do you think you could understand them? I like that confidence. Thank you. This side seems to be awake here. They, they show me some confidence. Well, let's take a couple. How about the commandment says... Thou shall not steal. Does that really mean that or is that open to our interpretation? Really means it. Because if it doesn't, I'm going to come out here and take your purses and wallets. <laughs> How about the commandment says, Thou shall not murder. Does that really mean that or is that open to our interpretation? Really means it. So God wrote these down himself on the stone tablets and we can understand these. Now let's go to Exodus 20, verse 11, and read this commandment where it starts. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. What did he write down? God wrote down himself six days. Therefore, if we do not believe Genesis teaches six literal days, as the language supports, then this commandment doesn't mean what it literally states and it's open to our interpretation. You see, we've been warned, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? If we give up the plain reading of Genesis chapter one, now we've given up commandment number four. If we can't trust commandment number four, if that's open to our interpretation, then how can we trust the other nine? See, our foundations start to fall apart that even Jesus believed in a young earth. Well, how does he know? He's the creator. And what did he say in Mark 10, verse 6? But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. What is Jesus telling us there? Jesus is telling us that man and woman were on this planet from the beginning of the creation, not after millions of years. Is he wrong? No, he's not, folks. Do you see there's overwhelming biblical evidence for literal six days? So conclusion in part one, based on the language structure and the internal consistency, Genesis is an historical account of creation that everything was created in six literal days. See, as Christians, we shouldn't be saying, oh, what about millions of years? As Christians, this is what we should be asking. Why did God take so long as six days to create everything? He could have done it in one second or six seconds. But why did he take so long as six days? Because we have a practical God, folks. Work six, rest one. Perfect for work week. Don't we have a great practical God who gave us a practical ex explanation? Work six, rest one. That's the question we should be asking. Why did he take so long? See, we limit God by our knowledge. He's not limited by our knowledge. He could have done it in six days, and he did. He could have done it in six seconds. So let's go to part two. Genesis is foundational for understanding the gospel of Jesus Christ. What I'd like to go through now is what I call the full context of the gospel. What we need to be teaching when we teach the gospel. And I'm not saying when you go out and witness. There's many ways to witness. You can do it in several scriptures. But I want to go through the entire gospel to show you that to understand the gospel, you must believe the first chapters of Genesis. And I'll start with John 3.16. Why do I start there? Because most people understand John 3.16. Most people know John 3.16. I've only been in one church where nobody in that church knew John 3.16 and they never invited me back. <laughs> For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There's a basic mini gospel right there. 
But what about John 3, 17? Very important verse. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. That word saved is very important here. Why do we need to be saved? And what do we need to be saved from? Now, to answer that question, now don't miss this one, folks, or it's push-ups for everybody. What book of the Bible do we have to go to to answer that question? Genesis. Thank you. I'm going to be sad if nobody does any push-ups here today. <laughs> so let's go to the book of Genesis. We start with Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. There again, that tells us who God is. He is the creator, which means he's the absolute sovereign ruler over everything because he owns everything. And he can set the rules and standards for how we are to live. And then it goes on in Genesis 1.31 to teach us that God's creation was perfect. He looked back on his entire creation and pronounced it very good. The Hebrew word there means exceedingly perfect, his creation. But then in Genesis 2, 16 and 17, God gives us one warning. Only one warning. Isn't that great? Just one warning. Do not eat of the fruit of this tree or there's going to be a penalty. And he tells what that penalty is. It will be death. Just one warning. That's all we've got to do. Just obey that one. And that now brings us to what we call the bad news portion of the gospel. Folks, you must understand the bad news so you can appreciate and understand the good news. Too often we start in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and say that's the gospel. No, it's, it's the core of the gospel, but it's not the full context. So let's go to the bad news. And the bad news starts in Genesis 3, 6. One warning, guess what Adam and Eve did? Broke that one rule right there. They ate of the fruit of the tree. We have sin, rebellion. And we have a God who keeps his promises. Death is now part of creation. All of creation is now under the curse. For you will surely die. Do you know the word surely in the Hebrew is the same word for die? The literal translation there is dying you will die. We spiritually died at that point, and the physical death process started. That's what the language teaches. And then we see the New Testament. What we're going to see here is the New Testament and the Old Testament just weave together in the gospel. In Romans 6.23, it says, the wages of sin is death. Isn't that what we just happened? We just saw that in Genesis. And here's the New Testament testifying that the Old Testament is true. Then in Matthew 5, 48, God gives us his standards. He can do this because he's the creator. And his standard is, we've got to be perfect. Is anybody here perfect? If you raise your hand, you're a liar. You know the closest thing to perfection? And I think you'll agree with this. The closest thing to perfection is grandchildren. How many agree with that? It's the parents that get in the way. <laughs> <laughs> and then guess what Romans 3.23 says same thing for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God no one is perfect isn't that great how the Old and New Testament come together here and then because of our sin because of our rebellion Isaiah 59.2 says we are separated from a perfect and holy God and at this point in the gospel folks we are left with no hope Every one of us is condemned for all eternity at this point in the gospel. That's sad news. But there's more to it. Now we can turn to the good news. But I also want to point out, remember our theme of the Bible, paradise created, paradise lost? Here's paradise created, and here's paradise lost in the, in the first part of the gospel, the bad news. But when we turn to the good news, okay, don't miss this one either. What book of the Bible does the good news start in? Genesis. Well trained. Well trained. Genesis 3.15, we have the first promise of victory, the first promise of a Savior. See, now we're going to start appreciating this good news. And guess what? That promise is fulfilled in John 3.16. See how this whole thing comes around. For God sent His only begotten Son... And then we go to the core of the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. For Christ died for, our, for what? According to the scriptures. He rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. What scriptures? The Old Testament. That's part of this, folks, the Old Testament. 
And then Jesus repeatedly says, repent, repent. It's not that repentance is salvation, but godly repentance leads you to the salvation. 2 Corinthians 7.10. Then in Romans 6.23, folks, this is where it gets exciting. This is where it really gets exciting. Because our God says this whole salvation that you can have is a free gift. What other religion in the world makes that claim? This whole salvation is a free gift. There's no other way but a free gift. And folks, this next verses are what separates Christianity from every other religion in the world. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It says, your works aren't good enough. You can't work your way to heaven. It's only through his mercy, his grace. That is the only thing where you can get to heaven. That separates us from every religion in the world. And this one, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. I run into this because I run into military people who tell me, Mike, God could not forgive me for what I did in the military. But God has an answer, folks. He tells us right here, his grace is sufficient to cover anything you have done. We have a very big sovereign God. And then it also tells us, he didn't wait for us to come to him. He came to us. Romans 5, 8. He demonstrated his love. He called every one of us here while we were still dead in our sins. Then he also says, John 14, 6, there's only one way in the book of Acts. There's no other name under all of heaven by which can be saved. It's only through Jesus Christ. And don't forget, it's a free gift. It's been paid for already. And then Romans 1, 19, 20 says, you don't have an excuse. Everyone here sitting here today, you do not have an excuse because God has told us. He's given us all the evidence. And no one who has ever lived on this planet has an excuse for not believing in a greater God. And then we finish with Romans 10, 9. Then if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. What is that verse telling us? Confess. What that means is you're going to make a promise. A promise of what? That you're going to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. Folks, this is the full context of the gospel. Do you know him? Have you accepted him? Why does all this matter? Is any my mind if I take a literal interpretation of the Bible for just a moment? Is that okay to do that? Take a literal interpretation? Well, let's do that. It doesn't matter what you say. I'm going to do it anyway because I don't want to mess up the Bible. We don't need to reinvent God's word. It starts off, in the beginning God created in Genesis 1 and it talks about six days of creation. Then it f finishes Genesis chapter 1 with his creation was perfect. Very good. Then comes the fall, and then comes death. That is the exact order the Bible reads. I did not change a thing there. That is the exact sequence things happen in the Bible. But look what happens when we add millions of years into there. We have creation going on for millions and millions of years. Finally along come Adam and Eve. Then comes the fall. So the question is, what was going on for those millions of years before Adam and Eve and the fall? And the answer would be death. Folks, a belief in millions of years is a clear belief in death before sin, which undermines the gospel of Jesus Christ, because now sin is no longer the cause of death. We have a serious issue in the church today where many do not believe God's word. They've tried to reinvent it by adding millions of years into scripture. And this is what's happening. The foundation for why Jesus had to go to the cross is being replaced. All the way from Genesis 1-1 all the way up through parts of the bad news. All of that is being replaced when you add millions of years into the Bible. Now, let me talk about this issue. Because there's an awful lot of people sitting in churches. There's an awful lot of our Christian university professors who will say, Oh, but Mike, science! Science has shown and proven the earth is old! Therefore, we need to reinterpret the first chapter of Genesis. First, ladies and gentlemen, no scientist on this planet can prove the earth is billions of years old. 
is beyond the construct of science to make that. But let me show you what it means if we use scientific evidence to reinterpret the Bible. First of all, God did not write the Bible to be understood by a small percentage of experts, did he? Secondly, if we use modern science to interpret scripture then, that means for over 1,800 years, nobody could fully understand the Bible. It wasn't until today our modern scientists finally told us what the Bible means. That's arrogance at its highest. Then, if we use science to interpret the Bible, we come to what I call an illogical conclusion. Because, folks, 50 years from now, we'll have a new scientific understanding, which means we have to reinterpret the Bible again. 50 years after that, we'll have a new understanding of science, we have to reinterpret the Bible again. So we can never really know what the Bible teaches, because we keep understanding science in new ways. And then finally, if we use scientific evidence to interpret the Bible, I'm going to call point three something called new revealed knowledge. Let me show you what this means. Mormonism, Joseph Smith, new revealed knowledge, new way to interpret scripture. Seventh-day Adventist, Ellen White, new revealed knowledge, new way to understand scripture. Church of Christ, scientist, Mary Baker Eddy, new revealed knowledge, new way to interpret the scripture. Jehovah Witness, Charles Russell, new revealed knowledge, new way to interpret scripture. Scientologist, L. Ron Hubbard, new revealed knowledge, new way to interpret scripture. Islam, Muhammad, new revealed knowledge, new way to interpret scripture. Scientific age, new revealed knowledge, new way to interpret scripture. Do you see the relationship there, folks? We don't need to reinvent God's word. For the past 18, 1900 years, 2000 years, people can read and understand God's word. We do not need scientific knowledge to understand God's word. Let's take God's word for how he gave us. He said, and he defined the word to be a literal day, not millions of years. Why that matters? If we can't believe the days of creation were little days, then when does a day mean a little day in the Bible? And what are the rules for understanding it? And let me go to this one, why it really matters. How many of you believe that Jesus Christ really died on that cross? Thank you. How many of you believe he really rose again on the third day? Now, why do you believe that? You didn't see it happen. Why do you believe it? It's in his word, isn't it? It's in his word. I'm going to make this a little harder. Did you know, according to all known science, you cannot be dead for three days and come back to life? So are you willing to go against known science and still believe the resurrection? Yes! There's where we have the contradiction within the church. They will believe the resurrection, even though it goes in that known science, but they will not believe that God did it in six days because their scientific knowledge doesn't, can't believe that. Folks, if you can't believe that Genesis teaches six literal days about 6,000 years ago, then you have no justification for believing the resurrection or else you're willing to contradict yourself. You see, this does matter. Conclusion part two, the authority of God's word. John 17, 17 says we're to be sanctified by his word because his word is truth. We're to be set apart. The first three chapters of Genesis lay the foundation for understanding the gospel of Jesus Christ. Matter the first three chapters of Genesis are the reason the entire rest of the Bible had to take place. That's how important it is. So part three, Genesis is the key to understanding the end times. Are you ready to speed things up a bit? I get excited about this one. Matter of fact, I get excited about all this. Okay, let's take a look at our theme. Paradise created, paradise lost, paradise restored, and it all points to Jesus Christ. Now we're going to talk about the paradise restored, the third part. And we find that in the book of Revelation. Notice there's no S on it. It's just Revelation. We're going to call this the bookends. Paradise lost, paradise restored. 
The curse is announced in Genesis chapter 3 verse 17. The curse is removed in Revelation 22 verse 3. We toil for food because of sin in Genesis 3 verses 18 and 19. We have an abundance of food in Revelation 22 verse 2. <coughs> Paradise lost. Genesis 3 19, death for all because of sin. No more death. Revelation 21 verse 4. What we're seeing is what we lost in Genesis. We're getting it all back in the end. Coats of skin to wear because of sin. Genesis 3, 21. Revelation 7, 14, we get clean linen. Genesis 3, 24, the tree of life is denied. Revelation 22, 2 and verse 14, the tree of life is supplied. Genesis 3, 23, we are banished from paradise because of our sin. Revelation 22, 14, we have entrance into heaven. Genesis 3.15, redemption is promised. Revelation 21.4, redemption is accomplished. Genesis 6.5, evil is everywhere. Revelation 21 verse 27, evil is excluded. Genesis 3.24, angels block the way. Revelation 22.1, angels show the way. Genesis 3, man is separated from God because of our sin. Revelation 21, 3, God dwells with man. And finally, Genesis 3 and Romans 8, 22, creation is corrupted. Revelation 21, 5, creation is restored. All things are new. Do you see the relationship between our bookends? That was a fast one, wasn't it? <coughs> Isn't that what pastors do? The first two points take half the day and the third point takes two minutes <laughs> sorry <laughs> so the first three chapters of Genesis ladies and gentlemen are critical to understanding the book of Revelation and now we'll go to the last part part four the battle for sovereignty the long war against God this is going to be amazing folks you're going to see the sovereignty of God here that he is the absolute ruler and we read this in Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10. Remember the former things of all, for I am God and there's no other. I am God and there's none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things are not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. He knows the beginning from the end. Well, I'm going to tell you here, God does not need backup plans. He has, his, he has everything set in motion. And he knows what's going to happen. He, he has one plan and that's it. So let's go through the battle of the ages. The kingdom of Satan against the kingdom of God. The conflict begins when Satan sees himself into thinking he could overthrow the sovereign rule of God and is heightened in the fall of man by the corruption of creation. Satan's attack, the certain Satan distorts the word of God, deceiving Adam and Eve. That's not what God really said. Let me tell you what he said. It sounds like some of our university professors, doesn't it? That's not what God really meant. But God's plan, it was already in motion before time began, folks. God counteracts by delivering a prophecy of a coming redeemer in Satan's doom right there in Genesis 3.15. We see this. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. What does the word enmity mean? Hostility, hatred. Folks, bruise his heel is a temporary wound because don't forget Jesus came up out of that grave, didn't he? To live forever and ever. Bruise his head, there will be a mortal wound to Satan. So there's our first promise of victory and a savior. Then Satan's attack, Cain slays Abel, the first murder in history. God's plan already in motion from the before time. God counteracts the murder by giving Adam and Eve another godly son named Seth, which means substitute. The Redeemer Christ will come through this line. Satan attacks again. He perverts the entire human race. What was God's plan? God counteracts by preserving the family of one righteous man, Noah, who descended from through Seth's line. Satan, in order to defeat the kingdom of God, sets out to destroy the nation of Israel. Israel is held captive by Egypt. 
What was God's plan? God raises up Moses to lead the nation out of slavery by sending ten plagues. And then we come to the church age. We're going rapidly through this. The church age. Saul wrecks havoc on the early church. Killing Christians everywhere. Well, what was God's plan before the beginning of time? God counteracts Satan's persecution of the church by doing what? Converting Saul to Christianity. Saul becomes Paul. What a plan he had. One of the greatest offenders of Christianity. He changes his life for all history. And turns him one of the greatest writers of the Bible. Who would have ever thought of that? Then Satan continues the attack, begins a universal persecution on the church. God counteracts the persecutions. The more the persecutions, the more the church grows and spreads out. Then Satan uses the Renaissance period to move the church into secular humanism. While the church continued its rituals, they forgot the claims of God. And what was God's plan? He counteracts with a new movement known as the Reformation. He raises up men like Martin Luther, Zingwilly, John Calvin, William Tyndall. Not that these per people were perfect, but God used them to preserve his word. <clears throat> then Satan not being able to destroy the church through persecution does one of his greatest attacks of all time he attacks the church from within see great, Satan's greatest attack is not physical persecution it's deception distorting God's word things like rationalism use human reason alone we don't need God's word we can figure it all out <laughs> deism the universe is governed by natural law apart from divine providence and intervention the rise of higher literary criticism destructive criticism of the bible the bible is not the inspired word of God and contains errors and the world view of materialism and the teaching of evolution gain a stronghold in the world including the church We hear things like, that's not really six little days. That's not what God meant. I've got the degrees. Let me tell you what he really said. Sounds like the Garden of Eden all over again, doesn't it? And then we talk about a worldwide flood. Genesis chapter 7 clearly defines this flood as a worldwide flood. But yet, what are we hearing in many of our Christian universities and many of our churches? That's not what God meant. It really wasn't a worldwide flood. I've got the degrees in geology. I can tell you what he really meant. What was God's plan? From the before time began, while Satan is assaulting the kingdom of God with false gospels and philosophy, God's plan is unprecedented missionary activity with men like Dwight L. Moody, R.A. Torrey, John Whitcomb, Henry Morris, who raised up to uphold the authority of God's word. And now it gets really exciting, folks. This is exciting. Revelation 20, verses 7 8. Satan's final attack. We've seen God's sovereignty all the way through history. Folks, there's more yet to come through God's sovereignty. In Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 8. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. And then we read in Revelation 20, verse 9, God's ultimate victory. And we read, And fire came down from God out of the heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, while the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever we have a sovereign God who is in control of all things he knows the beginning from the end and then we read in Revelation 21 verse 1 and I saw a new heaven and a new earth and the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea folks we have an absolute sovereign ruler who we can trust who loved us so much that he gave us only begotten son, sacrificed him on the cross so we could have that free gift of salvation. That's who our God is. And we come back to the theme, paradise created, paradise lost, paradise restored. And it all points to Jesus Christ. The very first verse of the Bible, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Jesus Christ is that creator. The very last book of the Bible, the revelation of Jesus Christ.
It is all about him. It is the only true history book of the world. He is indeed the absolute sovereign ruler over creation. And I know that. I was raised a non-believer. I grew up a non-believer. I wasn't even a Christian until I was 30. And I can understand God's patience and his mercy. I also used to be an athlete. And one day I was in gymnasium. Notice I said used to be. You understand that one. One day I was in gymnasium lifting weights. And you have to lift weights. If you run around, run, run around circles faster, jump higher, and throw things further, you have to lift weights. And I was in that gymnasium that day, and a man came up and sat down beside me. And for the first time in my life, somebody presented the gospel to me. Then he asked me some questions. I answered all his questions wrong and ignored everything he had to tell me. I had no room in my life for God. I walked away from him. Seven years later, I was on a business trip to Indianapolis. I got done work late one evening, got back to the hotel room, and got in bed. As I lay there in bed that night, I finally understood the message that man gave me seven years earlier. That's the night I got on my knees and gave my life to Jesus Christ. And after a while I got back in bed, I still couldn't go to sleep. I had a strong desire to teach the book of Genesis, which I had not even read yet. So I reached in the drawer in that hotel room and pulled out the Bible and began reading Genesis chapter 1. And as I was reading that chapter, I thought to myself, if I can't believe what's in that chapter, then there's no reason to read the rest of this book because I won't read it, won't trust it either. Or maybe, just maybe, some of what I was taught in the universities may not be true. So I had the opportunity to travel all over this country. Now I'd stop and talk to these scientists, and I'd talk to these professors, and I'd ask them questions about evolution. I soon found a pattern to their answers. They all had a lot of wonderful stories, but not one of them could directly answer my questions. Now that here's these people that tower above me in intelligence, and they cannot answer my basic questions about evolution. And if they can't do that, then why should I believe evolution? Because when I turned to the Bible, I was finding answers. Not only was I finding answers, folks, but I found something evolution can offer nobody. For the first time in my life, I now have hope. Several years ago, my wife and I went on a six-week speaking tour throughout the southeastern states. Six weeks, every day for six weeks, we were one or more churches or Christian schools. We stopped in one place in Jacksonville, Florida. That night, we were staying with the pastor. And after we got there, I sat across from this pastor, and we began talking. We talked about the Bible. We talked about creation. As we continued to talk, we started to change the conversation, talked about some things we had done in our past. And we found out we had both been in the United States Marine Corps. And once you find that out, you have an instant bond. So we began to reminisce what we had done in the Corps. And we found out we had both been stationed at Quantico, Virginia, a large Marine Corps training base. So we reminisced about that for a while. Then we found out we had both been stationed at Yuma, Arizona, a small Marine Corps air missile base. And we continued to talk about that, and we continued to talk and talk. And all of a sudden, he sat back in his chair, and he stopped talking. And he looked right at me. And he said this, I remember you. Do you remember me? 27 years ago, I gave you the gospel of Jesus Christ. God brought us back together again. See, that man did what he was supposed to do. And when each and every one of us sitting here this morning is commanded to do, that is go out and give the truth. Don't worry about changing anybody's lives. You can't do that. That's the Holy Spirit's job. But we can't give that truth if we don't know it. Let's thank our God. Go to prayer and thank our God, our creator, our sovereign ruler. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory. The victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you're exalted as head over all. 
Both riches and honor come from you and you reign over all. Oh Lord God, we know that riches and honor come from you. All power and might come from you. But oh God, who are we that you have called us and will allow us to be partakers in your salvation for all eternity. We thank you in Jesus Christ's name, our Lord, our Savior, and our Creator. Amen. Thank you, thank you for coming this morning. If you don't know him, please see the pastor here. And he has a lot of wisdom to give for you. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you.